I'd like to introduce Anand. He's actually built a five cell Ising computer. Yeah, each Ising cell is an electrical oscillator at 36 kilohertz. And I built five of them here on the breadboard. Let me turn one on so you can see what the output is. So behind me is an oscilloscope. It just plots the voltage versus time. And it looks like the voltage of oscillator number one is sinusoidal. Does this mean that the cell is plus one or minus one? I think computers work by phase. So this cell is plus one. And when another cell is in phase with this cell, it's also plus one. However, if another cell is out of phase with this cell, it's considered as minus one. Well, let's take a look at your Ising cell number two and see what it looks like on the oscilloscope. Sure. Now, it looks to me like Ising cell number two is moving all over the place. So I can't tell if it's plus one or minus one. Why is that? That's because the two cells are not phase locked. Oscillators can start with random phases and sometimes slightly different frequencies. And one way to get them to phase lock is by creating a coupling between the two oscillators. Right now, these two oscillators have resistive coupling between them. If the resistance is large, then the oscillators can't influence each other very much. If the resistance is small, then the oscillators will naturally phase lock to one another. Let me show you what happens when I reduce the resistance between the two oscillators. It looks like these two oscillators are phase locked now. The Hamiltonian of an Ising computer contains connections J between each cell. In the simplest Ising computer with just two cells, we only have J12. Resistive coupling creates a negative J. If J is negative and both oscillators are in phase with one another or plus one, then the Hamiltonian H is negative and it's minimized. If the two oscillators had hypothetically wound up out of phase with one another, then the Hamiltonian would have ended up positive. It didn't end up that way because the system has naturally minimized the Hamiltonian. If we want to program a positive J rather than a negative J, then we need a signal inverter in series to the resistor. And other than controlling the couplings J between each of the Ising cells, what's another way to get the cells to phase lock with one another? we can use subharmonic injection locking. I'm going to use the signal generator here to create a signal that is twice the frequency of the oscillators, and this will cause the two oscillators to either be in phase or out of phase with each other. But first, I need to remove the coupling between the two oscillators. And then I'm going to inject the 2F signal into the oscillators. and turn on the signal generator. So right now on the oscilloscope are three signals. Up at the top, we have the 2F signal provided by the function generator. And then we have Ising cell number one and Ising cell number two. It looks like the two Ising cells are out of phase with one another. That should happen about half of the time, right? Yes. If I turn the system off and on again, there is a chance that they might be in phase. Let's give it a try. So it looks like now they're in phase with one another. What Anand has done is built a five cell Ising computer with adjustable couplings between all of the cells with a 2F signal and injection locking to help get the cells to phase lock. So Anand, what sorts of problems can we solve with a five cell Ising computer? We can solve number partitioning problems like we did by simulation in the previous video. But I'd like to introduce to you a new kind of problem that's usually used for benchmarking Ising machines called MaxCut. I can show it to you over at the tablet computer. The max cut problem is also a partitioning problem, but in this case, we're trying to partition the graph such that the partitioning line cuts across the maximum number of edges possible. Let us go through a simple example. In this example, there are two nodes, the two circles. Let's call them sigma1 and sigma2. There's a line connecting the two nodes, and that is what we usually refer to as an edge. Well, this looks like a line to me. Why do you call a line an edge? Well, in computer science, this is what people usually refer it to as. Mm, interesting. Well, anyhow, I see only one edge or one line. So let me try to cut through this line. Yep, that is actually the correct answer. So I've partitioned this graph into two. And if we were going to solve this on an Ising computer, I assume that one of these cells would end up in the plus one state and the other would end up in the minus one state. Is yes. that right? 
Okay, so I suppose these could be reversed, right? Sigma 1 could be minus 1 and sigma 2 could be plus 1, but I suppose then the cut line would look exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at the Hamiltonian for this system. If we look at the Hamiltonian for a two-cell graph that we want to partition, we only have sigma 1, sigma 2, and only one j connecting the two cells. If we assign j12 the value of plus 1, and we also assume that sigma 1 is assigned plus 1, then there are only two possible outcomes for the Hamiltonian. If sigma 1 and sigma 2 are on opposite sides of a partition line, then the Hamiltonian would be minus 1, and that corresponds to the solution that we just saw. But n end, there's another solution where sigma 1 and sigma 2 are both plus 1. The Hamiltonian in this case is not minimized, so we hope the Ising computer would not give us this solution. But what sort of a partition of the graph would this hypothetically wrong solution correspond to? In this case, the partition doesn't cut anything at all. So, for example, it looked like this. I see. So in this case, sigma 1 and sigma 2 would both be plus 1 because they would lie on the same side of the partition. The solution's obviously wrong. Mm -hmm. How about we try another example? All right. So here we have three Ising cells. Let me try to draw a partition line that cuts through the most number of edges. Ah, but that's actually wrong. You can't cut through the same edge twice. I see. So in this case, I've cut through this particular edge two times. Let me try again. How about this? I've cut through each edge once. Well, that's actually wrong as well, because your partitioning line must start from outside the graph and end outside the graph. But in this case, you end it inside the graph. I see. So I can't end inside the graph, and I can't cut through any of the edges more than once. Let me try again. In this case, I've cut through two of the edges, and I don't see any way that I can cut through the third edge. Is this the right answer? This is actually the right answer. Okay, so if the Ising computer would give us the solution, then sigma 1 would be plus 1, and sigma 2 and sigma 3 would be minus 1. Mm -hmm. But it's actually not the only answer. There are actually two more possible answers, and let me show it to you. So one of the possible answers is when the partition cuts across sigma 2. And in this case, sigma 1 would be plus 1, sigma 2 would be minus 1, and sigma 3, since it's the same as sigma 1, it will also be plus 1. I see. Another possible solution is also when the partition cuts across sigma 3. And in this case, sigma 1 and 2 are plus 1, and sigma 3 is minus 1. Interesting. I'd like to take a look at the Hamiltonian for this three-cell graph partitioning problem. If we assign plus 1 to all of the j's, then there are four different outcomes for the Hamiltonian that would result from different partitions of the graph. The first three rows of this chart correspond to the three different solutions that Enon just outlined. These are the three correct solutions. They're equally correct because they cut through the same number of edges on the graph. The last solution is wrong because the Hamiltonian is not minimized, and the outcome for sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3 would all be positive 1. And, and what particular partition of the graph would this solution correspond to? The partition would actually look like this, where all of the sigmas lie on one side of the partition. I see. This is obviously wrong. Hopefully our Ising computer wouldn't give us this solution. Yeah. Well, let's try something harder with one more edge. All right, so here we have four edges. Let me give it a try. It looks like in this case I can cut through all of the edges. Is this the correct solution? This is actually the correct solution because you cut through all of the possible edges. I see. So if the Ising computer were going to give us this solution, it would put cells 1 and 3 into the same partition, and it would put cells 2 and 4 into the other partition. Yes. Do you want to try a slightly harder example now? Sure. All right, it looks like here we have five different cells. Let me give it a try. Let me see. Nope, I can't do that because I'm going twice through one edge. Uh, no, I can't get over to that cell. Okay, I'm missing one of the edges, but I have a feeling that I'm not going to be able to get over there to it. Well, this is actually the correct answer. Looks like you actually got the hang of it. How about I give you something slightly more challenging? Oh, I don't think I'm going to be able to do this one. <laughs> This is why we need Ising machines, to help us solve really complicated problems. Let's go back for a moment to your five-cell graph partitioning problem. Since you've actually created a five-cell Ising computer, maybe we can go over to the bench and use that computer to solve this particular graph partitioning problem. If it gives us the correct solution, then we should get plus 1 for cells 1, 2, and 4, and the computer should give us minus 1 for cells 3 and 5. Let's go have a look. Sure. 
This is a six channel oscilloscope. So we're using the top channel for the 2F injection locking signal and the other five channels for the five ising cells. We already know what the correct solution to this particular problem is and Anand has already programmed the connections corresponding to the five cell max cut problem that we solved over the tablet computer. So Anand, basically where there's no line connecting the two cells on the graph, you've just removed the connection. Yes, I've just removed the wires and the Ising machine is really well suited for the max cut problem. I'm really curious here if it's able to solve the problem correctly. Well, let me turn it on for you. So we have the 2F injection locking signal and it looks like cells 1, 2 and 3 are in phase with one another or plus 1 and Ising cells four and five are out of phase with one another or minus one. Anand, this solution isn't correct. Could you tell us why the wrong solution's coming up? As we all know from the previous video, if the subharmonic injection locking signal is too strong, then the system might not be able to converge to the correct answer. Also, there are a lot of variable resistors here that are hard to get just right. Usually for Ising machines, what we care about is getting the right answer with high probability. So if I off and on the system, we might get the correct answer eventually. And then maybe you can go ahead and turn it off and turn it back on again and let's see if we get the right solution. Sure. Okay. This time it worked. But for some of these problems, I have to manually turn the system off and on again a few hundred times to study it. What we normally care about with these Ising computers is not whether the correct solution comes up every single time, but whether or not the correct solution comes up with a high probability. We're going to have to find a way to automate this. 